To come here today, I thought I will meet Mr. Wang, Mr. Wang Wenlan, and I didn't meet him. <laughs> I was disappointed. But I looked through those pictures, there are 18 of them on the wall, this side. I feel I knew him. I knew him for at least for 40 years, because that's the time I grew up in China. And uh, I looked at the pictures, almost every single picture, not the one after I left. I left China in 1987, but those black and white pictures, I feel I can walk into any pictures and just relive my life in China, Beijing, China, on the street, in Tiananmen Square. There are many, many places, especially that one by the entrance, because that picture took at the Tiananmen Square, 1976. I believe that's after uh, Mr. Zhou and I passed away in January 8th. And I was there. I was even look into the picture, look for myself, <laughs> hoping for to see myself, because I was right there. I was thousands and thousands of people, but I was close enough to the monument. And that picture looked so familiar to me. So I feel so close to Mr. Wang Wenlan. I, I, I feel I knew him for, uh, for a long time. And I feel his work, well, I'm not feel, I, his work is a part of my life. So I'm so honored to be here. And uh, uh, one of the magazine photographers, I forgot who, uh, who, who, who uh, I forgot the name, but one of the photographers said once, he said, uh, it's only take a moment to take a picture, but it take a, we spend the rest of our life trying to figure out its meanings. And I look at those pictures, they all take it by the moment, and all last for lifelong, and it continues to last the meanings. And we still look at the picture looking for the meanings. And that's the power of, of photojournalism. And that's the power of every single picture. And black and white, different times, different uh, perspective lives. And uh, when I look into um, articles, uh, over the weekend, try to study Mr. Wang Wenlan. And one picture, not those pictures, one picture caught my eye. You probably all see it. It's the one, he has his right thumb, touches the left index fingers, and the left thumb touches the right, right uh, index fingers. This pose, it was so familiar to me. I looked at the pose, I said, that, I knew this guy because that's my peer. That's what we do. That's what a photographer do. That we keep that with us. We cannot have a camera with us all the time. But we have our hands, and we can form a frame with our hands. And here comes passion of a photographer. Here comes imagination. We can just cut that piece of life, and we try to keep it forever. And of course, with camera, that happens. That's what you see those photos here. And that's what one one line did for that last 40 years. And that's what I did for the last 25 years. Well, it's a little bit different. I, was, I, I do video. I do uh, television news. But uh, uh, growing up in China, but by the time I meet Clay, I was about, I always thought I wanted to be a still photographer. And uh, of course, I studied television news photographer at the Beijing Broadcast Institute. That's why I meet Clay. So I switched from wanting to be a still photographer to becoming a television news photographer. That's a huge change for me, but it's still, the work's the same, the passion's the same, the pursuit's the same, same as Mr. Wang Wenlan. And I, uh, I remember uh, 19, the two days after Christmas, 1990, I got a call from KNBC. I've been calling them, sending resume. I, I, I did this television work back in China. I was working at the Beijing uh, television station. So I said, is there any chance I can work at one of the prestigious, prestigious stations at, in America, like NBC? So I got a call from uh, uh, Mr. Billingsley, the person who's in charge of hiring photographers. And he said, come over, we we'll have a short talk, and I bring the resume tape. So I bought my resume tape. At the tape I put it together, the material I worked uh, back in Beijing. It was some news uh, footage, some uh, beautiful thing I shot. Just put them together and uh, went to uh, Burbank at KBC. 
and I gave the tape to uh, Mr. Binningsley, and uh, we had a little talk about the background and everything. Then they, he got up, he said, oh, I'd like to see your work. And that comes, the, hit my nervous, because I said, because I, most of the talk, I, he said it to me, some, you know, uh, about the NBC, about the work. I only understand, like, uh, maybe 15%, 20%. <laughs> But I know it's a part of the interview, how to go through, then now here comes the video. So I, I, I was so nervous, I said, Mr. Binningsley, there's one thing you already know, but I had to say one more time. I, I don't speak the English. And so he popped the video into the machine, the VCR, and he did one thing I'll never forget. And he went over the video, he turned on the audio, he turned on the knob, he said, I don't need to listen to any sound. I want to watch your pictures. A good picture can tell a great story. If you can do that, you're one of us. So he watched that for three minutes, and he got up, and he said, Mr. Lee, we all come to NBC. That was the greatest moment of my life. <laughs> so, but still, I still don't speak English. <laughs> it's still a problem. <laughs> so I can tell you, for the first year I worked at NBC, there are so many times I got a location, I got an address, I got to know, I, I got to go to the place. I don't quite totally understand what happened, but uh, weekly I know it's a news event. So driving to the news event, I was always a sweat, always like a nervous, like a, is this is the time? Because the last time I did it, and the day before I did it, is it today the day, the day I dropped the ball? Because I never know what I'm stepping into. So whenever that moment come, to shake, them, you know, my confidence was sh shaken up. I always tell myself, there's a voice in my mind telling myself, it's like, a, hey, you don't speak English, but you don't use the language to tell the story. You use a picture to tell a story. Just go get a better picture. Every time when I thought about that, the confidence comes back. I know when I step into the news scene, either it's a crime or breaking news or any kind of event. I don't, I'm not afraid of anything because I can get a better picture. That's what I do for a living. And that's what uh, my passion, and that's what uh, Mr. Juan Milan did for, for, for the last four decades. So that's why I feel strongly connected to uh, Mr. Juan Milan. And uh, uh, Juan Milan's picture chronicles the life daily life of, uh, of uh, Beijing, uh, of China, actually. There's national photos. I, I did read um, China Daily. Uh, well, I probably was one of a few Chinese people who uh, read China Daily. I remember it was the early 80s when there was the first English language pa paper launched. It was the, I think it was a spin out from a People's Daily. And it was an official newspaper. But what a difference there was the picture. The photo come up bigger and um, more often focus on not like a people daily, just you know, leaders or um, propaganda uh, kind of a topic. It's more of a real people, real life. So we all saw that. And uh, uh, as when I say, I read the China Daily because it's English. I didn't read China Daily. I looked at the picture of China <laughs> Daily. <laughs> so, so, I, I, so I remember lots of good pictures. And uh, not a particular that one, but I, I can see the style. That's the picture from China Daily from early 80s. That picture from China Daily from early 80s because you, can, you don't see anything else in China like that. So that was the trademark of China Daily. And so that's why I feel so like a relief my life. Well, I don't want to relief my, my life. It, 1980s in Beijing, but uh, but I do through these pictures. Anyway, so I can tell you another story. Uh, when I think about the Warren Lance picture, uh, you know, the, he documented history. I always uh, envy still photographers, actually. I want to be a still photographer to begin with. I always envy them because whenever they got a good moment, a good picture, they can print big, frame it, put it on the wall. But we cannot do that. That's the, that's the most common thing. Uh, common complaints among uh, TV photographers. It's like, uh, look, we were there, they were there, they're on the newspaper, and uh, later they frame the picture hanging over forever. All footage for forgiven. Nobody will go watch 
yes, it is TV news. So we said like a, well, but once well, when there's 20 years anniversary of a, a riot, and uh, you know the news station always play the montage of the of the of the history, and uh, we all sit together like, oh, I did that. That's my picture. That I remember at KNBC actually. It was a national, uh, national news because it was bigger than, than local news. And uh, uh, NBC News, uh, for 20 years of anniversary, they, they wrote a montage of the video of a riot. When that one thing, picture, one video popped up, the little teenager a boy holding a, a garden hose and uh, tried to put out the, well, the, the film is gone, but they put on the smoke, and they behind him, it was the, uh, there's a huge window uh, uh, right, uh, black owned because that building stands because you know it was African American business owned. So that video shot by me. So when I shot that, I, I jumped out and I go, look, I did that. <laughs> See, it's my way of a chronicle of history, uh, the preserved. But uh, for that moment, we were all getting excited. And uh, the, the, my best story I can tell you is uh, in early 1991, when I just started working at KMBC, for some reason, I got involved in this huge court case. It was uh, Kristen Barando. Uh, most of you know he was uh, convicted for killing his uh, sister's uh, boyfriend. And uh, the sentencing day at Santa Monica Courthouse, uh, Mr. Barando, Moran Barando, the, the actor, come to the courthouse to plead the case for his son, to basically ask judge um, leniencies. So that was a huge story. And um, for courtroom coverage, the judge, the judge only allowed one camera, as a pool camera. And uh, it's one camera will represent all the television stations. For newspapers, the same way I remember that day, in the courtroom, there was a Los Angeles Times photographer. So there's two photographers in, in the courtroom. And for some reason, they came to see the new guy like me, I didn't even understand. I still don't understand <laughs> these days why I was put in that position. We have uh, five photographers there. So I was the one on the camera in the courtroom and uh, stand next to the Los Angeles Times still photographer who, who also the pool uh, photographer for other newspapers. Yeah. And one radio uh, reporter, three of them there. So when Mr. Brando took the microphone, as he was sitting next to the judge, and that's the, the most powerful moment. That's the moment they're all waiting for. And uh, I heard the camera clicking. I heard uh, uh, you know, the video guy put in the microphone. Everything's so intense. And I was the one on a big video camera. And uh, with a cable plugged into my camera, I go to the next room, which is a huge press room. There are more than 50 stations recording live. It was a huge, huge news event, including uh, French TV, because uh, the victim was from Tahiti, and uh, NHK from Japan, Australia TV, everybody, all other major networks. So I was the one on the camera, and uh, the only image they can get is through my camera, through my lens. So when Mr. Brand was speaking, and uh, I was look at his face, that's my next object. I look at my face, look at his, I look at his face, and when he was just, when he was talking, I noticed his hands start shaking, and his uh, lips starting evaporating. I know he's getting emotional. So at that moment, I broke all the courtroom photographers' rule, which is like a medium wide, boring. To me, it's really boring. So I just push, 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 zoom in, and uh, at Santa Monica Courthouse, for somehow they have this uh, big old antique type of microphone. <laughs> and it was just so. Per perfect for me because I can zoom in, bypass the microphone, the microphone will be all of the focus was a blur and uh, put Mr. Brando in the focus, really close up shot. And uh, better than that, the moment I zoom into his face, the tear comes out of his eye. <laughs> really, he cried and he was arch The funny part is I, I didn't understand what he was saying. <laughs> but he was talking to the judge, he was talking to the judge, but I see the tear. I see the face, and uh, now I stay on, on this close-up for like a rest of his speech. And fast forward, in 2004, when, Brandon, when Martin Brando passed away, and uh, all NBC stations played this image. 
This was the last file footage image we got from a Miranda, Brando. And uh, uh, I remember it was MSNBC, one of MSNBC analysts, could be uh, Chris Matthew, he said, this is Brando's best performance. <laughs> that was it. And when I watched that, I was like, what he said? This was his best performance? Marin Brando, the best performer, arguably, arguably, the best performer probably Hollywood ever produced. The best actor since the first motion picture, The Birth of a Nation. His best performance filmed and kept on video by me, a wild-eyed 29-year-old, fresh off a boat, new immigrants from Beijing, China. And that's, that's the biggest reward, I think, as a photographer, as a TV photographer, can ever ask for. So, uh, um, you know, when I come here, I was so nervous. I never speak in English in front of a crowd. <laughs> you guys, you guys, this is my first. <laughs> I hope it's not the last. <laughs> so I did prepare some material, but uh, forget about them. <laughs> I just want to speak off of my heart. And I'm really happy to be here. I'm really uh, glad to see those photos and really uh, got me, really uh, got my emotions. And I remember um, when um, uh, Andrew Adams, uh, another great photographer of the 20th century, when he decided to switch from a piano pia playing piano to a professional photographer, and his mother said to him, said, Andrew, don't give up piano because camera cannot express human soul. And he said, mother, a camera can't, but a photographer can. So you look at every single picture taken by Mr. Wang Wenlan. Every single picture expressed human soul and it touched human soul. And uh, in a way, it changed a lot of people's lives and open lots of people's, people's eyes. And that's what we do as a photographer. And we, we want to use a picture to tell a story, and then we want to use a picture to express ourselves, and we want to use a picture to inform people and to change people. And uh, uh, we're, st we're all story storytellers. I think the best way to tell the story, the best way to uh, inform the people, the most effective way to change society is the photojournalism. So for that, by closing, I want to say long live photojournalism.